Hi, and welcome to this video on solving the procurement data dilemma. I'm your host, Gren Manuel, and today I'm speaking to Peter Smith, who's had a distinguished career in procurement, including being CPO of NatWest Group. He's been a senior advisor on procurement to the National Audit Office and past president of the Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply. And many of you will know Peter from his eight years he spent as the authoritative and frankly quite entertaining managing editor of Spend Matters Europe, Europe's leading procurement and supply chain website. Um, Peter, actually, you've got a new book coming out called Bad Buying, How Organizations Waste Billions Through Failures, Fraud and F-Ups. How can procurement data avoid any of these failures, fraud and F-Ups that you mention? Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Gren. Thank you for uh, inviting me to speak. I, I think understanding your suppliers properly is really at the core of good procurement and certainly at the core of avoiding mistakes and failures and frauds and so on. Um, and understanding your suppliers takes several forms, but clearly having good data about your, your suppliers is a big part of that. Uh, and if you don't understand your suppliers, if you don't have the data, how can you understand the markets they operate in? How can you decide how you choose the best suppliers to do the work you need them to do? So it really is um, a basis for, for good procurement performance, I think. Then once you've got suppliers in place, we've got another whole category of, of data that again plays into avoiding the failures and, and doing, the, doing the right things, which is performance data and information. So our suppliers actually doing what you want them to, are they adhering to the terms of the contract and, and that sort of thing. And data can also help avoid fraud and corruption. And that unfor perhaps unfortunately is quite a big part of my, uh, my new book. Um, and it's amazing the range of, of fraud that we see across the world that's linked to procurement in some way. It's not surprising because that's where money flows and you get, you get fraud, you get corruption where, where there is money that can be extracted. So again, if you don't have good supplier data, you, you can get some, some, well, both huge frauds uh, and, and often quite, quite basic frauds. So just as an example, and this actually was too late to put in the book, but I know the um, very big global company headquartered in Europe, and they recently in an Asian country uh, lost through fraud to some equivalent to an entire year's revenue and that was through um, cooperation, if you like, between people inside the firm and outsiders, basically creation of fake suppliers, and then lots of money being paid out to these suppliers via invoices for services that were never delivered. And it was only noticed when, when huge sums of money had already gone out the door. And of course, those suppliers have disappeared into the ether, never to be seen again. And a lot of that comes down, frankly, to poor data management practices and processes uh, and not keeping on top of who, who your suppliers are and making sure all your suppliers are real companies and so on. But how, how do you use data to solve these problems? It starts really, I think, with rigorous onboarding of your suppliers. So in other words, before any firm is accepted as a supplier, before you start doing business with them, and certainly before you pay them any money, there's a process of checking that you have all the right information about them so that you can verify they are who they say they are, that they're legitimate, that they're not. I mean, in some countries, um, there are concerns that, that suppliers uh, may be a front for organized crime, for instance. They may have directors with a criminal record. They may only have been created as suppliers three weeks ago. That's a bit of a warning sign, for instance. So it starts with onboarding, doing those checks, getting an initial batch of data uh, that gives you a good foundation then for building on that. And then as you start dealing with the company, you can add data around their performance. You might be interested in um, sustainability issues, working practices, modern slavery now, all, all the things we, we worry about as well as just can they do the job. Um, but it all starts really with that onboarding and getting the uh, vendor master data, as we tend to call it, um, getting that set up so it can then be maintained and built on as you go through their relation, your relationship with the supplier. And, 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 if, and if you want this kind of, sort of precise data control, I mean, is it now accepted that this can't be done with a, one of these all-in-one uh, suites? The, the, the procurement technology suites. Yeah. 
I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's fair to say it can't be done. I think we've seen many discussions over the last decade or so in terms of this debate between the best to breed approach. So, so choosing the best software to do different aspects of the the wider procurement task versus buying a single suite that can do a lot of different things and and none of the suites can do everything. I think that's absolutely clear. So there's been a lot of debate about this. I think there's a couple of um, myths really here. One is that anybody, uh, any big company uses a pure suite approach because I don't know a single company that, that hasn't got multiple different types of procurement technology, procurement software because it's grown up over years. Firms make acquisitions and mergers, different parts of the firm have different needs. So I don't think there's a single business actually um, can say, you know, we're a hundred percent sweet. And I think increasingly firms have realized that uh, the best suites can do a lot, but if you really require the best performance in some particular areas, uh, and that's true whether it's data management, risk management, sourcing, um, catalogs within the purchase to pay area. If you have a particular need and you've identified that you need the best in, in that, then you're missing out if you restrict yourself to a small number of suites. You really need to look more widely um, and, and make that choice from, from the best of breed providers and, and the suite providers. I, I mean, there's no need to say, you know, we're only going to use best of breed. It's a case of opening up that, that competition. I, and I think most companies now probably accept that's, that's the right approach. And indeed, even the, the large suite providers, um, it's interesting, they've both made acquisitions of some quite different companies. So some of them had an initial logic that they would all be on a single platform and it would all be you know, their product. And uh, not many of them have stuck to that over the years. They've tended to make best of breed acquisitions, actually. Um, and also, most of them happily work with best of breed providers where they, they know that there's something that can be gained by using, using those third parties, if you like. But, but what, what can procurement do to um, sort of focus on strategic goals and sort of board level issues, taking more of an approach like sort of business first, function second? Yeah, and, and that's a nice way of putting it, I think. When, when I first started in procurement many, many years ago, uh, in many organizations, we were seen a bit as the spend police. So uh, as a Dilbert cartoon once said, um, procurement was there to, to stop people getting the things they needed to do their jobs. And, and we were tasked with reducing costs and stopping spend in some cases, or controlling spend, let's say. And I think over the last couple of decades, we've realized that if, if procurement uh, does have a real role to play and wants to be taken seriously, we've got to get aligned with the wider organizational goals. So whether that's growing revenue, um, working capital management, risk and resilience in the supply chain, procurement's made the argument quite successfully in most cases that, hang on, we can contribute in all those areas as well. We can still be interested in cost control. Let's not forget that. But there's a lot more that procurement, procurement can offer, I think. And, and of course, uh, there's the whole issue of sustainability as well. Yes, well, that, that's probably been the biggest change in the last decade, uh, the way that sustainable procurement, procurement with purpose has, has moved up the agenda really. Um, and most leading companies now and public sector bodies are, are really interested in issues such as climate change and emissions, the natural world, deforestation, modern slavery, human rights, diversity in the supply chain. And there's Generally, a lot more organizations can do in those areas working with and through their supply chains than they can do purely internally. So they can save a bit of energy in head office by turning off the lights. But if they can work with their major suppliers to do significant um, changes and developments that, that reduce emissions or reduce deforestation, there's a whole lot more that can be done through procurement and supply chain management. So, so that's been a big change. And I think what organizations have realized is the key to it is is focusing on where you can really make a difference so Unilever who've done a, a huge amount even Unilever realized they, they couldn't 
they couldn't do everything in every area. So they focused in, in uh, supply chain areas where they felt they could really make a difference, like palm oil, which links to deforestation uh, and working conditions in the supply chain. And it would be, it would be pointless, a small advertising company or a local council trying to, trying to address deforestation. You know, they just couldn't have an impact. But the local council could have an impact on diversity in the supply chain. They could encourage local suppliers to take on more disadvantaged people, uh, people with disabilities, promote apprenticeships, get more women into engineering and construction jobs. There's a whole host of worthwhile agendas within that wider uh, procurement with purpose movement that can be addressed. I mean, this sounds like a colossal um, data collection and, and processing exercise. Well, I'm not sure so much about the processing. There's certainly some data collection because if you want to start looking, for instance, at your supplier profile in terms of diversity or how many smaller businesses you've got there, um, you, you do need to understand your supply base back to where we started in the discussion. And uh, if, if you don't have that, then how can you launch a sensible program? If you don't know where your base raw materials are being produced, so maybe two or three tiers down the supply chain, um, then it's difficult to go back and address human rights issues in mining or agriculture or in, in distant countries. So, so yeah, there, there is data that's, that's needed. And then, and then again, you would collect performance data and you, you'd keep on top of that. But it is an issue. I mean, when the UK government started focusing more on encouraging small suppliers, I was involved in that more than 10 years ago. And, and we just didn't have the data. Government departments didn't know how many of their suppliers were, were SMEs. And when we talked to the big suppliers like IBM or Rolls-Royce or Capita, they didn't know either. So it was impossible to sort of track progress on that. Um, so that has all increased the requirement for for data and for good data and um, data that's kept up to date and, and is meaningful. Of course, we're talking, you know, in the middle of a, a pandemic here. Um, my guess is that there's been, you know, a huge new focus on resilience within the supply chain. I, absolutely. Yes. And um, I, I think most of the procurement articles and webinars and so on I've seen coming into my inbox in the last few months, risk and resilience is, is the number one topic without a doubt. And I think lots of private sector firms have, um, have had issues, supply issues and so on. We don't tend to hear about them so much. We've heard a lot more about the public sector issues, things like PPE, protective equipment in the health systems, uh, UK and globally. Um, and that's really brought home the fact that we can't just look at buying at a good price and having suppliers who in normal times deliver on time. That's all great. But how do we cope when when there is a shock to the system and, and the pandemic's been a, a unique shock to the system, but there are more frequent shocks. You know, there are natural disasters. There are earthquakes and floods and, and tsunamis and you have fires in factories and you have political problems and they can all affect supply and, and organizations I think have become more aware that they need to, again, understand their suppliers, know, where manufacturing facilities are, understand maybe the second tier or even the third tier of supplies for really critical materials so that they get a view of what the risk profile really, really looks like and can then focus on mitigating those risks in, in some way. Yeah, risk and resilience and data to support that has, has gone shooting up the agenda in the last six months. Uh, I hope that's a permanent change. I hope people don't just forget that in another, another few months' time. I don't, I don't think they will. I think it's changed things forever. But as, as, I mean, as the procurement department makes a greater contribution to the sort of broader goals of the company, it yeah. means that people within procurement are going to be talking to the board more. I mean, what's the best way of doing this? How do they convince them of the value of the function and, and what value they can bring to the, to the broader organisation? Yeah, well, I, I think it's that, that issue of relating what you're doing to the, the strategic goals. So it's no good just saying, you know, we've, we've, we've done X or we've, we've onboarded 10,000 suppliers into our new system. Well, jolly good. That's very exciting. But if you can, if you can uh, put that in terms of reducing risk, 
we've reduced risk of, of fraud, you know, and, and I'm a great believer in telling stories and having good data. So if you can tell stories, but if you can also relate it to data and say, you know, do you realize we handle X million invoices a year? We pay out this much money to suppliers. If, if only 1% of that was going to the wrong places, it's, it's X million. So I think a com combination of numbers, data, if you like, and, and the stories that resonate and they remember, uh, and all of it linked to the, the, the organizational goals and priorities um, is, is the thing to do. One of my first big presentations to the board when I was a procurement director, CPO, I made the mistake. Spend Analytics was a quite an early stage there. So we just got our first ever sort of list across the corporation of our top 30 suppliers. And, and rather than presenting it as this is, uh, this is what we're going to do with it and this is the actions we're going to take and this is how it's going to benefit us, I just sort of stuck a slide up showing top 30 suppliers. And it then descended into 20 minutes of board level argument uh, about, well, who's, who's using, who's buying so much from Unisys and who's doing this? And I don't believe that number and that one can't be right. And I, I never actually got back to the agenda I, I wanted to and the decisions I wanted out of the board because they'd never seen this data before. So they were fascinated by it, but I hadn't, I hadn't linked the data to actions and what it meant and, and what we could do with it and so on. So I'd be cautious about, even if you're very proud of your data, you know, just presenting data to top level people, uh, there's a danger they just won't be interested or they might be almost too interested, which was uh, what happened to me. And also, of course, the data needs to be accurate. Well, well, that's the other, the other risk. And I have seen, um, this didn't happen to me on that occasion, but I have see, seen people being demolished at board level presentations where they, they put up data and, you know, the head of one of the divisions says, well, that's not right. You, you've put something up saying we spend 10 million pounds globally with IBM. I know my division spends 28 million a year, you know, and I can show you the numbers there and then you've lost all credibility. So yeah, if, you, if you're going to present data, it better be, it better be right. <laughs> well, I think that's a good uh, cautionary tale to end with. Uh, thank you to Peter Smith. Um, this video is part of a series on data and procurement pr produced by uh, Hicks Solutions. Uh, look out for the others coming very soon. Thank you.